at West Virginia University studying in energy and environmental resource management with a uh, minor in economics. I will be graduating this year and plan on coming back to West Virginia next year uh, to pursue my master's in energy environments. Um, I did a little bit of research on this project that we're working on and did a little bit of a preliminary preliminary sampling when we went up originally at the site. So I have a little bit of a presentation for what we've been uh, what we got going on. All right. Now, how do I? Oh, yeah, just let me know when you want me to advance the slide, but you are good to go. OK, so then uh, hold on one second. OK, you can go ahead. All right, so we're going to start off with West Virginia surface mining. You can go to the next one. Uh, there are a lot of impacts of surface mining. Um, West Virginia is a large producer of coal and has an extensive history of surface mining. There are numerous mines throughout the state covering from 4,000 to 12,000 acres. The process of surface mining and everything that goes into it is a large contributor uh, to greenhouse gas emissions, which this study looks to mitigate. Uh, because mining is a large boost in local economies, after uh, mining ending ends, communities need development to sustain them. So that can be done by planting C4 plants to sequester carbon. And that brings us to reclaimed mine sites using C4 plants. And you can go to the next slide, please. All right, there's some conservational benefits that uh, that come from using C4 plants. Uh, planting plots can provide ha uh, local habitat for animal species. Prior mining, mining disrupts the species to this. Sorry, one second, hold on. Prior mining disrupts the, I'm sorry, this is just, one second here. My internet's kind of being a little glitchy right here. One second, sorry. All right, there we go. Study site and other information. Uh, this study will be taking place in Alton, West Virginia at, uh, at the DLM site. In 2010, this was an originally a biofuel production study. If you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, it's on a former mine and bond forfeiture site called the DLM, and it's home to hundreds of marginally uh, reclaimed mine lands that can be used for the uh, C4 plants. All right, you can go to the next one. Thank you. So in 2010, we planted 20 plots of miscanthus and switch grants on cultivars, which were uh, initially for a biofuel production study. The study now will be focused on uh, green biomass development from the C4 plants um, coming from carbon sequestration. All right, and then you can go to the next slide, please. All right, and this comes to C4 plants and their ability to sequester carbon. And then that brings us to switchgrass and miscanthus. C4 grasses like miscanthus and switchgrass are tall growing perennial grass with extensive root systems that help with the efficiency of photosynthesis. They grow well on marginally reclaimed soils, which is perfect for former mine sites. The soil on these sites are rough for, from surface mining, but switchgrass and miscanthus have the ability to grow well on pH characteristics of mine soils similar to the DLM site, as well as other mine sites. Reclaimed mine soils have low soil fertility, with lower soil nutrients, as well as higher acidic soil values compared to agricultural soils, which is a reason switchgrass and miscanthus is good for restoring the soil on the reclaimed mine lands. Coming to C4 plants, uh, C4 and, or I mean switchgrass and miscanthus are both C4 plants. 
So when they return their litter to the soil and their roots turn over, some of the carbon in those materials cannot be accessed by the microbes in the soil, and the soil organic carbon becomes uh, stable and is considered sequestered into the soil. This is because the optimal carbon fixation pathway of C4 plants makes this process more efficient and is, has higher rates of photosynthesis and productivity. C4 plants only make up about 3% of terrestrial plants, but are highly efficient at biomass production. This is because of the unique carbon, fix, carbon fixation pathway. The atmospheric carbon is taken by these plants during photosynthesis and use the shoots to capture atmospheric carbon and the, the roots to sequester it into the soil. Carbon fixation caused by photosynthesis helps in growth and development of other living communities, which in turn leads to more plant growth and carbon sequestered. Soils reclaimed with municipal bio, biosolids like switch, switchgrass and miscanthus are attributed to high soil organic matter amounts, increases the soil carbon, and acts as a net reduction to, of atmospheric carbon. Now with that, you can uh, credit the carbon. You can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Communities need development to sustain them after mining stops. Crediting carbon sequestration as well as switchgrass biomass production on these reclaimed mine lands creates new post-mine economic benefits. There is an emerging market for carbon crediting and farmers can get paid to adopt practices. Some companies like Google want to offset greenhouse gas emissions and they can help fund these farmers programs. Carbon farming can turn the industry into a greenhouse gas emitter into a carbon absorber. Cropping alone can sequester 4% of annual CO2 emissions. All right, and this goes into the study objectives. You can switch the slide, please. Thank you. So first would be to closely examine carbon sequestration levels of C4 plants from 10 years of growth to compare abilities of different cultivars. Then it determined the feasibility of utilizing reclaimed mine lands as an opportunity for greenhouse gas mitigation. And then finally, demonstrate carbon credit potential for reclaimed mine lands, offering recommendations for future planning of C4 plants on similar sites. All right, thank you. If you can go to the next one. All right, now the methods for this, if you can go to the next, thank you, include sampling takes place at the DLM site. The different plots of C4 plants are extracted using a tool like a shovel or a backhoe to get through the rougher soil and root system. Samples includes the roots, the shoots, and the surrounding soil and is separated by different plant types. Samples of the soil, the roots, the shoots are sent to the lab to be tested for organic carbon as well as other soil nutrients using the Walkley Black method and the Lawson ignition method. This is used to get uh, to determine the levels of organic carbon. Testing will continue until April, and then the data will be analyzed to determine greenhouse gas mitigation at this site and future sites. Now we go to the benefits of this. Uh, this creates the use of C4 plants for carbon sequestration at these sites creates innovative carbon reduction solutions. It takes a former carbon emitting site into a mitigation site, creating other conservational benefits for wildlife communities. Carbon crediting offers economic benefits to local communities after mining stops. Sequestering carbon is a cost-effective way to slowly and passively mitigate climate change while improving soil fertility. And then this is just the project timeline here. All right, thank you. And then you can go to the next slide. And then the Appalachian Stewardship Foundation is uh, funding this project, so we'd like to give a thanks to them. And then that is uh, everything that I have. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Jacob. Uh, our next presenter is Jason Philhart, and I will let Jason introduce himself and talk a little bit about his position. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Philhart, and I am the Watershed Project Manager here at the Water Research Institute. Um, I've been working with water quality here at the Institute for about 10 years. 
Um, and my presentation today is on AMD rare earth elements slash critical materials um, and how they tie in with watershed uh, restoration efforts. I'm going to share my screen. All right, are we all, can we all see that all right? We see um, your slides, um, like the list of slides on the left. It's not full screen. Uh, okay. Um, if you go to slideshow. Yeah. Okay. Am I showing the wrong screen now? Yeah, we're seeing your notes. <laughs> right, sorry, let me let me switch this over. It's always fun when you have multiple monitors. <laughs> <laughs> All right, new share. Sorry. Let's see if this works. Is that better? We're not seeing anything yet. Nothing. No. no. All right, give me one second. Screen two, share. We're seeing your file directory now. <laughs> Let me pull the PowerPoint up again. And... <laughs> You are totally fine. Um, oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Let you get to it. Sorry about that. Um, take a look. All right. So thanks, everyone. Um, again, I'm going to be uh, discussing AMD and rare earth elements. Uh, also, in with that is critical materials and how they relate to uh, watershed scale restoration. All right. So AMD and REE. So we have. AMD on the left, acid mine drainage. And then we have uh, some of what goes, what is made from rare earth elements on the right. So everybody has a cell phone these days. Look down, look at your cell phone. That's made of all kinds of rare earth elements and critical materials. Uh, there's an old cell phone there on the right. And some of you younger folks may not have seen anything like that. But <laughs> uh, And then also magnets uh goes they go into your computers um just a lot of things you wouldn't normally think of that include rare earth elements and critical materials so what are our rare earth elements uh there are 17 of them i am not going to attempt to pronounce every one of them um if martin were on this call i don't know if he's on here yet or if he's joining but he he will he would gladly pronounce all of them for you um <laughs> But uh, these are the 17 rare earth elements, and they appear in low concentrations in the ground. So along with that, we have our critical materials, and uh, they are uh, any substance and technology that is subject to supply risks uh, for which there are no easy substitutes. So in 2022, we had around 50 on the United States list. Uh, some examples are aluminum, lithium, cesium, nickel, and again, I'm not going to name all of them. So getting to rare earth production. So why is this such a, a hot topic? Well, uh, the major reason is that China accounts for around 80% of our supply. So as you can see from this graph, uh, we do produce some rare earths. However, we are be way behind China in our production levels, uh, behind Australia, and we're, uh, we're in a, a long away and distant third as far as our rare earth production goes. So sort of 
working back and how this relates to our watersheds, I just thought I'd throw in a little bit here on uh, a look at our watersheds in West Virginia. So we have seven, seven major basins in West Virginia, uh, 32 watersheds divided into Huck 8 codes. So the waters of the Eastern Continental Divide, of course, flow to the Ohio River. I'm sorry, the waters of the Western Continental Divide flow to the Ohio River. In the east, uh, we go towards the Potomac and some towards the James. And amongst these, we have these smaller sub-basins. And a lot of these sub-basins have severe degradation due to AMD issues. And there's a map of our Huck 8 watersheds. As I said, we have uh, 32 in the state of West Virginia. All right, so how does this relate to the National Mine Line, Mine Line Reclamation Center? So the NMLRC is a part of WRI. And in 1988, Congress recognized the need for an organization to specifically address the outstanding reclamation problems and authorize formation of the NMLRC. Uh, we became a leader in such uh, projects as alkaline amendment, uh, AMD prediction methods, pneumatic slurry placement, spoil handling, remining, um, and passive AMD systems. So we have worked with numerous uh, watershed groups throughout West Virginia to address AMD and install these passive treatment systems. Um, and this slide photo is one of the recent projects we've worked on. This is the Mars Portals, which is out around Colton, West Virginia. So how does this relate to watershed scale restoration? So as I said before, we have multiple sub-basins within uh, West Virginia that have severe degradation. And historically, we have treated these sources as single sources of AMD whenever it comes to treatment. Um, and that is due to funding restrictions. However, um, we've been able to tackle a few projects that are on a larger scale and take more of the entire watershed into consideration recently. Um, and hopefully with the BIL funding, uh, these more centralized large scale projects are gonna be more of a reality uh, than just a vision. So one of the ones that we've recently uh, worked on and been involved with is the Muddy Creek treatment facility, Muddy Creek slash TNT. Um, and that was a, a, a partnership between um, us and the DEP uh, special rec group and, and AML. There's just a lot of folks that had involvement in this project, Friends of Cheat. Um, and we're continually working on a few new projects. One is on the left fork, Little Sandy, which is a larger uh, centralized treatment facility and another one on the, um, I'm sorry, that one. And then we we look to be looking on, working on a few more here in the near future. Uh, all right. So how do we produce these rare earth elements and um, how does it relate to the watershed scale restoration? So historically, AMD treatment in West Virginia has re resulted in sludge handling issues. Uh, so we really don't know what to do with the sludge once it's produced and once it's there. Um, we we have to, uh, do, we, do we bury it? Do we move it off site? Do we landfill it? Uh, it becomes a negative byproduct of AMD treatment. However, now with the introduction of uh, rare earth extraction from this material out of the AMD, we're, rec we're starting to recognize it as an opportunity and not just uh, another byproduct. So the critical materials rare earth elements team at WU, they've developed methods to extract these rare earth and critical materials out of the AMD. And again, so instead of the unwanted byproduct, we now have the opportunity to transform this, uh, this negative byproduct into something of value. Uh, there's a few disadvantages with sourcing rare earth elements and critical materials from AMD. Um, sometimes it can be low concentrations, so it requires collection from uh, many sites. Uh, you need to manage the up upstream supply chain. And along with that, you have to consider quality control, the moisture, and the grade. All these things can uh, you know, come into play 
and be a disadvantage if it's not managed properly. However, there are a lot of advantages uh, for this extraction from AMD. So one is that uh, we, there's already permitted sites, so we have no delays due to permitting, uh, easy to quantify yield and minimal exploration of cost. You're just looking at sample analysis for your cost exploration. It's environmentally beneficial, so you get uh, a byproduct of clean water. Uh, the solid wastes are non-hazardous or classified as non-haz. It's can often this can lead to job distribution uh, across uh, broad areas. Uh, another it incentivizes treatment of legacy AMD discharges. So some of these discharges that people may not necessarily have wanted to uh, address before, now that there is a value uh, set and and added to that discharge. Um, you're going to want to see treatment more often. Uh, there's often uniform feedstock across mine sectors, and it's very attractive economics. So we have to pay a lot of money to treat these AMD discharges, and this extraction of rare earth elements and critical materials can offset the treatment of costs for some of these sites. So we've identified multiple watersheds that will benefit from large-scale restoration projects. And many of these uh, watersheds have the potential for rare earth extraction and, and production. So to quantify that along with the, um, the watershed restoration scale, uh, we have a, you have a lower cost. And then you have a high watershed benefit, and often we we feel that we will be able to meet TMDL compliance. And these large consolidated AMD treatment plants are better for the rare earth recovery because you have um, better feedstock and product quality control. And then it's also a little bit easier to manage the logistics and infrastructure whenever you have one centralized treatment system instead of say eight to 10 passive systems throughout a watershed. All right, so just to sum up, so countless uh, West Virginia watersheds have been negatively impacted by legacy coal mining issues. And these issues uh, of course persist despite efforts from uh, universities, the uh, DEP, higher education, uh, other higher education entities, grassroots groups throughout the state. So along with that, there's only been an opportunity to treat AMD discharge as a single source, and this is due to funding constraints. Uh, but however, with this additional 140 million per year invested in the AML program, there's now an opportunity to treat these sources at a large with large scale centralized treatment systems, which the rare earth extraction and critical material extraction can be built into the design plans. So we can manage these large uh, AMD treatment projects to include the uh, rare earth extraction and critical materials extraction whenever we're in design phase. So this will uh, again offset costs and reduce the negative byproducts from AMD. And any questions? We will have a chance for some questions. Oh, we're going to do that at the at the end. Yeah. Okay. But feel free to put them in the chat if you're thinking them, so that we don't lose any of them. Um, but for now, uh, let's turn things over to Rachel. Uh, if you could give us a quick introduction of yourself, Rachel, and then present, and then we'll do questions for all three presenters afterwards. Oh, thanks, Becca. Um, is everyone seeing my screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. My name is Rachel Spernak, and I'm a water resources specialist here at WRI. I've been here for a little bit over two years and I assist with our acid mine drainage treatment programs, um, a lot of what Jason was talking about, and also with our long-term water quality programs and research projects such as our Three Rivers Quest program and a lot more. <laughs> uh, so today I'll be talking about one of our current projects entitled 
evaluating remote economic benefits of watershed scale acid my drainage restoration. Here's just an overview of uh, my presentation for today. And I'll start with some background information. So I think we're all pretty familiar with acid mine drainage or AMD. Um, in simple terms, it is polluted water that comes out of abandoned mines. And we have a lot of it here in West Virginia. In the Appalachian Basin, over 5,000 kilometers of streams are impaired by acid mine drainage from abandoned coal mines. Um, and it often causes discoloration, such as iron staining and metal sedimentation in streams. It also can carry an unpleasant odor. It affects drinking water and causes corrosion of pipes and other infrastructure. Uh, as a result of the acidity in the metals, biological communities uh, shift to more tolerant species, and overall fish and macroinvertebrate diversity decreases dramatically. Uh, this is especially true for sensitive species like book trout, uh, which are especially vulnerable to high sensitivity to acidification, and their headwater habitat often coincides with areas rich in coal. So for all of those reasons, many AMD streams are referred to as dead because they're practically devoid of life, and in turn we lose out on fishery and recreational opportunities, as well as the associated health and well-being benefits they carry. Uh, the treatment of AMD consists of the neutralization of acidity and precipitation of metal. It can be passive or active depending on the scope of the project and the chemistry of the source. The active treatment is used in the more severe cases of AMD and it utilizes continuous additions of alkaline chemical reagents to neutralize that acidity. And in this picture, we have a in-stream lime doser, which is one type of active treatment. And uh, we'll be talking about that today. Uh, as Jason mentioned, the typical approach for AMD restoration is to treat at source. However, uh, it's been become a priority to treat at a watershed scale level. Um, and this is necessary due to the extent of AMD and also the costliness of the remediation. Uh, and this approach prioritizes strategic, <clears throat> excuse me, strategic planning to achieve significant improvements while targeting a smaller percentage of the problem sources. So in addition to the many ecological benefits of AMD restoration are all of these economic benefits. Uh, one that I forgot to include on this slide somehow is the rare earth element production, which is now an associated benefit of AMD treatment. Uh, but we have market values such as recreation and tourism-based spending and decreased cost of water treatment. We also have non-market amenities. Uh, this includes uh, water quality, which can be capitalized into the price of housing unit or property values. Um, however, many important benefits of improved water quality are really difficult to attach to a market value. These include ecosystem services, biodiversity, existence, and bequest values. Um, and it's very difficult to put a price on the inherent value of a intact ecosystem. So most researchers utilize one valuation method as a surrogate for the total economic benefit. Uh, the most appropriate method depends on the availability of various types of data, your study area size, and also site-specific economic and biophysical characteristics. Uh, so this table describes several of the most common approaches, and you can see that um, some are utilized to estimate potential benefits, and then some are used to quantify actual benefits of restoration after it's occurred as well. Um, and so in our study, we're looking to quantify actual benefits after restoration. And so our two methods that we could choose from would be the hedonic modeling approach and the travel cost method. However, the travel cost method didn't seem suitable since we're really focusing on the remote benefits in rural parts of West Virginia that don't have an established recreation or tourism industry. Um, a lot of the research on economic benefits that has been done has focused on those watersheds in the past. 
And so we chose uh, to go towards the hedonic modeling approach. But that being said, uh, we did not complete a full hedonic model in this study. Rather, um, this is kind of a first step at quantifying remote economic benefits. Uh, property values may be a good option for capturing these remote benefits. Uh, an increase in streamside property values has been cited oftentimes as a potential benefit of watershed restoration, uh, such as in Thurston's economic analysis for Decker's Creek. However, few post-restoration studies have been completed to quantify the actual benefits that have occurred. And to our knowledge, none have been completed for acid mine drainage restoration. Property value differentials uh, reveal property owners' willingness to pay for stream restoration. And this can be accomplished through a time series or cross-sectional approach. A cross-sectional approach would compare um, qualities of an impaired stream to a reference stream, while time series compares the same stream at different periods of time, so before and after restoration. Uh, there are very few time series property value studies in the literature, and to our knowledge, none for AMD specifically. And so uh, this project investigates changes in property values post-restoration in a West Virginia watershed as a case study for remote economic benefits of watershed scale AMD restoration. And I also want to bring attention, the study I'm discussing is just a small part of a project led by Eric Bowen, who's a researcher at WVU's Bureau of, of, Bureau of Business and Economics, um, and he's conducting a full economic impact analysis for restoration of three watersheds, including the one that I'm going to discuss. So our portion is just a small case study for one of those watersheds, and we focus on streamside property values. So our objectives, uh, number one, find the percent change in property value over time for a restored watershed. And number two, correlate property value changes to the distance from the stream. Now is a crucial time to evaluate these economic benefits um, since treated watersheds, some treated watersheds have reached the age where full restoration can be quantified um, since AMD restoration does take time. And also a large money is expected to be utilized with the bipartisan infrastructure law and especially with the push for watershed scale treatment. Um, the findings can be utilized as justification for these future projects in similar watersheds. Our methods, and we're going to start with the study site. Um, so our study site is the Three Fork Creek watershed. It's 103 square miles in a subwatershed of the Tigert River located in Taylor Preston and Montegalia counties of North Central West Virginia. All analyses performed in the study are bound by this geographic constraint of the watershed, which is highlighted in yellow. <clears throat> and the reason why we chose this site, um, some background, it has extensive pre-law coal mining conducted within the headwaters, which left behind over a hundred abandoned mines within the watershed. Um, several of the headwater tributaries, as well as the main stem of Three Fork Creek, were impacted with AMD. In 2004, the West Virginia Division of Natural Resources determined that this watershed was the second highest contributor of AMD in the entire Monongahela River system. And so this watershed was used as one of the first examples of watershed scale restoration in West Virginia. In 2011, the West Virginia AML installed four in-stream active Lyme dosers, and they've been operating since then. Um, WRI also had a role in strategizing and, um, you know, coming up with these locations for the most optimal treatment. Um, so these dosers are placed in the impaired headwater streams for the greatest overall full watershed impact. For the purposes of this study, we focus on the main stem of Three Fork Creek, which is the segment shown in blue on this map, since it captures the combined impact of the four in-stream dosers of the headwater tributaries. And those dosers are the stars on the map. 
Uh, the site has already documented uh, visual improvements. Um, as you can see in the pictures, there's decreased iron staining. Um, it's been removed from the West Virginia Impaired Waters list for aluminum in 2014. And fish diversity in brook trout populations have increased significantly and continue to increase. Um, there have been a few studies on the water quality benefits um, or improvements, and also the study on the fish and macroinvertebrate improvements. So 2010 and 2021 parcel records were used for this study, and the 2010 values represent pre-remediation, the 2021 values represent 10 years post-remediation. Property assessments were obtained for each parcel within the watershed using the West Virginia Property Viewer, which is an online application. This information was then geocoded into existing parcel shapefile in ArcGIS Pro along with the property class. Uh, the 2010 values were adjusted to $2021 to account for inflation. And then the uh, percent change in property value was calculated in GIS by creating a field with this equation. <clears throat> uh, we only used parcels that were fully contained within the watershed and contained assessments for both years, 2010 and 2021. And so in total, that was 5,461 parcels. <clears throat> We also created three buffers so that we could compare the property value changes uh, between these distances from the stream. <clears throat> and so we have a quarter mile, a half mile, and one mile. Now our results, uh, the property class. So you can see that uh, the parcels classified as farm made up the largest area of the watershed but the number of residential parcels far exceeded that uh, at 81% of the total. Now for the property value changes, uh, this map shows the percent property value change throughout the entire watershed, and it's broken up based on the statistical quartiles. Within the watershed, uh, property values increased on average 85%, from 2010 to 2021, so that's watershed-wide. Um, property values increased positively as areas were focused closer to the stream. So the change in property values was greatest within the quarter mile buffer at 181%. So this research furthers the growing research in quantifying economic benefits of watershed restoration and can be used to demonstrate successes of treatment and justification for similar projects. However, there are quite a few limitations. So number one is a key assumption. Um, this depends on the average person's awareness of water quality levels and assumes that the improvements are observed by visual improvements and color and clarity and increased fishing and other recreational activities within the stream. And again, this is not a full hedonic study, so it doesn't account for all the other factors that may affect property values, such as um, flood risk, and you know, there's quite a few. And this also doesn't uh, account for improvements to the headwater tributaries. Um, so by only correlating to the main stem, we don't account for those improvements um, in the entire watershed up in the headwaters. Um, and also that doesn't account for um, the improved con connectivity throughout the watershed. Uh, the study is a first good step, a good first step, however, uh, lending itself to several future research directions. So number one would entail separating all of the characteristics that affect property values and accounting for them in creating a model um, so that the effect of environmental improvement can be accurately quantified. Number two would be to investigate the correlation with water quality throughout the watershed to determine if it has an effect on property value. A fantastic study would be to combine 
the hedonic property valuation with other valuations to determine a more full picture of economic benefits within the watershed. And finally, georeferencing the parcel data for all of West Virginia into GIS data sets would allow the study to be replicated in other watersheds and would lend itself to many additional studies. You could also compare um, different watersheds, counties, regions with each other to determine trends. And so that would be really great to compare the results from this watershed with a watershed that um, you know, is still poor quality and hasn't been restored yet. And we are also looking forward to the results from Eric Bowen's economic impact study um, with this watershed and uh, two others. And so here are my references. And I'd also like to acknowledge the USGS 104B program for funding the research and our collaborators at other colleges here at WVU. Thanks. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right. Thank you so much. So now we're going to open it up for questions to any presenters. I see we have some questions already in the chat. So I'm just going to throw questions that I see at all three of you. And whoever wants to answer it can go for it. So uh, first question from Claire. Are there any rare earth elements slash critical materials reclamation plants in operation? That is a great question. And we are, I don't know, days away from putting one online at Mount Storm. Eliza, can you <laughs> can you uh, can you help me out with how how close we are? Yeah, I'd say we're probably a week to a month away from okay. being in operation at Mount Storm. Okay, great. So yeah, in Grant uh, Mount Storm, which is in Grant County, uh, we have a um, large um, treatment plant there that includes rare earth and uh, critical materials extraction. So great, thank you. Uh, Peter asks, without going into specific numbers, are the potential profits from the rare earth elements seen to be large enough over time to make a significant dent in the cost of the of the water treatment? That's a great, Chris. Great question as well. So, um, with some of these more centralized treatment facilities uh, that have uh, been installed recently, and that we're working on designing. Uh, what we what we've concluded is that they're not going to necessarily uh, make a large dent in the capital costs. However, all these systems require consistent operation and maintenance, operation and maintenance, which of co course includes uh, uh, cost. And uh, we found that we will likely be able to offset a lot of these O and M costs with uh, rare earth and critical materials extraction. Um, so. Okay, so that would lead into the next question that I see, which is, has our Brad developed watershed scale restoration plans ready for implementation? Yes, uh, we have. We're, we're working with the DEP right now, um, AML program, um, as part of some of this bipartisan infrastructure law funding that uh, we've recently received, at uh, that the state's recently received. So, yes. All right, thank you. Um, question from Alan to Rachel. Were you able to determine how much of the property assessment growth was due to increased improvements like new housing on the properties? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so the answer is no. Um, we strictly just looked at the increase and um, we didn't do the full hedonic model. So we didn't account for um, things like, you know, the age of the home or, you know, in the case of new construction, um, that would have a really big impact. Um, so good question, and that would be a good uh, future step. Definitely. Okay, uh, we got another question from Peter. With regards to the carbon sequestration using the C4 plants, is there any pressure from either official or local sources to plant more native plants, even if they are less effective? Um, 
I don't have a for sure answer for you, but I don't believe that there would be uh, really any pressure to plant native plants as long as um, uh, I mean, if they're if it's more effective, then I guess the C4 plants would be better off. But um, it just comes down to the price of them, which I think the cost of switchgrass and miscanthus is starting to rise. So if there was a native plant that was cheaper and around the same effectiveness, I guess that would be something that they would look into, but there hasn't been any uh, like official or local sources to plant more native uh, native plants now. Yeah, and to add to that, on these uh, reclaimed mine land sites, there's a lot of invasive plants there. So if you can cut out the invasives, um, with even though it's going to be a monoculture, monoculture like um, habitat, whenever you have the switchgrass and the miscanthus, it's also uh, a lot more beneficial as far as habitat and and soil production goes uh, over a lot of these invasive plants that just sort of come in and take over these reclaimed mine lands. So. Okay, we are open for questions. If you have anything else, oh, uh, Joshua Green has a hand raised. Uh, go ahead, unmute yourself if you would like. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. It's very interesting, and and uh, I think congratulations on your your work. Um, I would be interested. I think that the technique of comparing by distance to the the restored or or the creek that's under restoration. Is, is a good technique, but I, I would wonder if you could use that same technique looking at the negative. So, you know, looking at uh, the decrease or the lack of uh, rise and increase to the same rate as others when the water is contaminated. So, you know, this, you know, kind of historical data looking at has there been, can we first associate a negative cost and then, you know, then compare. I, I think you're, you're, you're going towards the right direction with you know, comparing to creeks that haven't been restored, but also trying to see that, you know, that negative is going to be where you find <clears throat> maybe the stronger argument. But uh, congratulations and, and thank you very much. Thanks, Josh. <clears throat> Great. Any other questions or comments? Uh, we would love to, oh, sorry, uh, Josh is, did you have another question or is your hand just still raised? Oh, it's gone. Sorry, it was still up. I didn't, uh, working on the cell phone here. Sorry. Thank you. Oh, you're good. You're good. Thanks. Um, yeah, should we get a group photo, you think, Rachel? Yeah, if, uh, if uh, more folks uh -huh. want to turn off their, or turn on their cameras. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's get a group photo. If you do have camera capabilities, um, we would love to see your face. Have it for our social media. Document that you were here and you got to connect with us today. Um, uh, let's also give a hand to our presenters while people are still turning on their cameras. So uh, thank you all. That's, I know, a lot of pressure to be up there talking. So thank you so much for your work and for presenting today. Okay. And we'll just take a picture. One, two, three. And for good measure, we'll do just one more. Oh. Admitting. Okay. One, two, three. Excellent. Okay. 
Well, thank you again. Um, as mentioned previously in the chat, we will be sending out slides and a recording. Uh, we'll have those posted to our website, so you'll get an email. And thank you again for coming. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.